I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend His cause. Maintain the honors of His word, the glory of His cross. Hello, I'm James Brown, and on behalf of the East End Church of Christ, located in Toronto, Canada, I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday Sermon Edition of Walking Through the Bible, a podcast where we seek to study the Bible and the Bible alone. Please stick around afterwards for information on how you can contact us. But for now, we'll turn you over to Jeremy Dieselcam for our sermon of the day. Do you devote yourself to deceitful spirits? Do you practice the teaching of demons? Or are you following after teachers who constantly lie to you? I understand without context, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. After all, we don't often get accused of following after demons, even by those who strongly disagree with us. But these questions aren't based on my personal experience per se, but based off what Paul has recorded to us in his first letter to Timothy. So you can turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 to 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Now the Spirit expressly says in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons through the insincerity of liars whose conscience are <coughs> seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. Now, the previous chapter, chapter 3, concluded with Paul telling Timothy that his, uh, of his purpose for writing Timothy, which was that Timothy would know how to properly behave or to properly live a godly life among the church, God's people. Now, why would Paul need to tell Timothy and explain to Timothy, a preacher of the truth, on how to live a godly life? Well, we might say that no person, not even a preacher, is exempt from temptation to sin. So thus, it is not wrong to instruct Timothy in this way. And while that is absolutely true, I don't believe that was Paul's primary motivation here. Sure, Timothy would face general temptation. And he would need to be properly trained to rebuff that. But here, Paul is training Timothy for a different type of temptation, following false doctrine. You see, what we have to remember is that in verse 12 of 1 Timothy 4, we, we find out that Timothy is still a young man. That's where the phrase, do not let anyone despise your youth. Timothy is still a young man. He's not a teenager by any means probably in his 30s, but that is still young. Now, from speaking from experience as a young preacher, there are a few pitfalls with being young. You run into people who might not listen to you because you were young, or you run into the temptation that you might listen to the doctrines that older people teach simply because they are older and longer in the faith than you. Timothy would therefore not only have to be prepared to recognize the truth and follow the truth, but he had to recognize what false doctrine looked like and be able to expose that false doctrine so that others would be prevented from following it. Paul warned Timothy that these false doctrines would be deceitful. In other words, the doctrines would sound like truth. They might even look like truth, but underneath they were the doctrines of demons. The ones teaching those doctrines Paul refers to as liars whose consciences are seared. What that means, those consciences are seared, means that those teachers have taught these false doctrines so long that their conscience no longer bothers them when they lie. In fact, they may even have convinced themselves that their lies are the truth. Our conscience is a tool given to us by God to convict us of sin. But unless it is properly trained and heeded, it is useless in that task. That's why the Bible, not our conscience, should be our guide in matters of right and wrong. 
For the Bible standard doesn't change. Well, our conscience's standard could. Well, what were some of these false doctrines that Timothy would face? Well, there would be those who would teach it was wrong to marry, forbidding to marry. While others might teach that Christians should abstain from meats. Paul would explain that such teachings are wrong and were not from God. When it comes to meats, verse 4 explains that everything created by God is good and should not be rejected but received with thanksgiving. Now this doesn't mean that everything we use something for is good. For the prohibition of eating, of eating blood from Acts 15 is still prohibited. But what it means is that there is nothing that God created that is sinful in and of itself, and therefore we shouldn't reject it as sinful. We do not have clean and unclean meats in the New Testament. Therefore, we are allowed to eat whatever meat we want. And we're also allowed not to eat meat if we so choose. What we're forbidden to do, however, is to go around teaching that it is sinful to eat meat or that God has commanded us to abstain from meat, even if it's a partial abstention at certain times of the year. Catholics do this during the time of Lent, a doctrine that is false, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, the same could be said of marriage. The Bible teaches that marriage was made by God and is approved by God. In Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6, we read, He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. This last verse is so powerful. What God has joined together, let not man separate. If God joins something together, what he has joined is not sinful, but righteous. The institution of marriage is not something created by man in order for them to subjugate women. It's created by God so that man and woman would not be alone, but have a companion in life that they were totally committed to thus establishing the ideal environment to bring up children. Hebrews 13 verse 4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. With marriage being held in such high regard, we can't go around teaching that it is wrong for people to get married. In fact, it is confusing to many, myself included, as to why people professing to be Christians would want to go around teaching a doctrine that would forbid Christians to marry in the first place. With abstaining from meats, at least you could go back to the Old Testament to find some justification, even if such justification is mistaken. But such is not the case with marriage. So for the rest of today, I'd like to focus on, on what forbidding to marry is and what it is not. Let's first start by looking at what forbidding to marry is not. For if we can find out what forbidding to marry does not mean, it becomes easier to understand what Paul is actually talking about in this verse. By looking at the phrase itself, it would appear that Paul is telling Timothy that it is wrong to tell a Christian not to get married to someone. That's, after all, what the phrase literally means. But is that what Paul is saying here? Now, I know the answer to that question is no, for if it was, Paul would have transgressed his own instructions when writing to the Corinthians. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to spend a lot of time this morning in this chapter, so you can put your marker there if you have one. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's read verses 25 through 27. Now, concerning the betrothed, or some versions that say concerning virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. Now, in this passage, Paul is giving his advice. The Corinthians had obviously written to Paul, asking him 
a few questions that over the course of these next few chapters in this book, he is going about answering it. Because the beginning of the chapter says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. And this is obviously the first matter Paul's dealing with. Over the course of the chapter, Paul is laying out what the Lord had commanded the Corinthians to do concerning fornication concerning spousal responsibilities to each other, concerning marriage to an unbeliever, as well as divorce and separation. But in verse 25, among all of the commands of Christ is Paul's advice to the unmarried in Corinth. He advises the married in Corinth too, but his advice to the unmarried is found here. His advice, if you're not married at the present time, don't get married. Why? Is Paul a woman hater? No. Paul praised women at various times in his books for all of the work that they did for the cause of Christ. The reason he gave was because it would be easier during this time of persecution for a person to be single and be able to move around quickly than it would to be married and thus concerned with your wife and your children's safety on top of your own. As a single person, I can attest to this freedom. I'll give you an example. Last Sunday when I left here uh, after service, I was not planning on going anywhere. I was planning on this being a fairly normal week. And then I get a report from my parents that they are not well and our dog was not well and unfortunately he had to be put down. But I decided at the drop of the hat, you know, I'm going to have to go home to take care of my parents, to help out around the house with, with, for them. As a single person, I could make that choice without having to concern myself with, well, what, 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 what's my wife gonna have to do? Or are the children gonna be able to have to, or to be able to go through that? I could make that decision very quickly. I couldn't do that if I was a married person. There would be a lot more considerations. Doesn't mean that I couldn't do it. Just means there's a lot more considerations. <clears throat> I can come and go as I please if I'm single. That's why Paul is advising the unmarried to remain unmarried in this situation. But I'd like you to note here that Paul made sure to tell the Corinthians that they would not sin if they didn't heed his advice. Let's read verse 28 of 1 Corinthians 7. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman or a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. Why would the Corinthians not sin if they didn't listen to Paul's words in this instance? Because after all, in other places, he said, listen to my words, heed my words. They are the words of Christ. Because verse 25 says that Paul's advice about remaining unmarried was not a command of the Lord, but his own personal judgment. If it was a command of the Lord, then the Corinthians would be sinning had they not followed it. But since they wouldn't sin, we know that following Paul's advice was optional. In other words, Paul wasn't forbidding marriage but providing guidance on, a specific, on this specific case. Now knowing this to be true, would lead us to ask the question, why would the Lord allow Paul to give his personal advice here? Because after all, these are inspired scriptures. And I do believe the Holy Spirit allowed this. It was not that Paul decided, well, I'm just gonna go off on my own. Although it's not explicitly stated, I believe the Lord allowed this because the Corinthians asked him the question, about whether it was sinful to marry at that time. Paul's answer was no, it's not sinful to marry. In fact, it is good to marry. But at that time, it would be wiser not to marry so that they would be better able to endure persecution. Paul's advice didn't contradict God's word, but used God's word to arrive at sound judgment just like we do today. We use God's word to arrive at sound judgment. We must make sure that when we arrive at sound judgment that God's word does not explicitly say that we do not bind it as sinful 
if it is not sinful. Something might be wise not to do, but not sinful to do. We need to consider all of God's word. So getting back to 1 Timothy 4, forbidding to marry isn't talking about giving someone advice on whether or not they should marry at a given time. But it also doesn't mean that, te that teaching someone that some marriages would be sinful to enter into. The doctrine of marriage, divorce, and remarriage is too big for us to completely discuss in this lesson. But there are those who are out there who say, and I've seen their writings, that anyone who teaches that some, un some marriages are unlawful are forbidding marriage and following the doctrines of demons. While they might use this line to try and win an argument, what they are doing is unwittingly accusing our Lord and Savior of teaching demonic doctrines. In Matthew 19, verse 9, we read, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. That verse is very clear. Whoever, meaning anybody, who divorces their wife, you can insert husband there, except for the cause of sexual immorality, which is fornication or unfaithfulness, and marries another, commits adultery. Can an unforgiven adulterer go to heaven? And the answer to that is no. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, swindlers will enter and inherit the kingdom of God. Going back to Matthew 19, though, when does adultery occur? Does it occur when a person wrongly divorces their spouse? No. Does it occur when a wrongly divorced person has sexual relations with another person? No. Such would be fornication and would be sinful, but that's not the adultery spoken of in Matthew 19.9. The adultery in Matthew 19.9 occurs when the wrongly divorced person marries again. It is the marriage itself, not the sexual relationship or the divorce that causes adultery. Therefore, if I'm going to repent of this adultery, I must stop committing the adultery, which in this case means ending the unlawful marriage. But wouldn't that mean Jesus is forbidding marriage? No, he's not forbidding all marriages. He is simply outlining what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable to God. God has told us that marriage is to be between a man and a woman, and that marriage is to be for life. In normal circumstances, that means each one of us, if we choose to marry at all, will have only one spouse. Now, if our spouse dies, Romans 7, 1 to 3 would tell us that we are free to marry again. And going back to Matthew 19, 9, if we divorce, if we divorce our spouse for fornication, then we have permission to marry again. Those are God's rules, and if I'm going to live as a Christian, I'm not only going to follow God's rules, I'm going to teach others to follow God's rules. When I teach the truth found in the Bible, I'm not forbidding marriage any more than I am when I'm teaching the homosexual that they can't be married and be pleasing to God. As I said last week, we cannot pit one scripture against another. We must follow both. Since God does restrict marriage in certain cases, we can know that 1 Timothy 4 is not talking, when it's saying about forbidding marriages, about teaching against unscriptural marriages. So what is 1 Timothy 4 talking about? Well, in eliminating brotherly advice and scriptural commandment from the equation, what we're left with is a doctrine that would teach that the unmarried are holier in the eyes of God than married people are, and therefore would be better equipped to lead the church. Now, that might sound confusing to you, but just take a look at the Catholic Church. Take a look at the papacy and the priesthood. That's the doctrine. That's what they're teaching. That's why the Pope 
is not married. That's why priests are forbidden to be married, because they believe that those people are holier than people who are married. But how has this doctrine become so appealing today as it was in Timothy's day? Because those people who twist scripture to make their point, it's deceitful. And people who do not notice, who do not study their Bibles daily, who do not pay attention, will blindly follow that teaching. <laughs> Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 7. I told you we were going to be there for a little bit. We're going to take a look at verses 1 to 9, and then we're going to read verses 32 to 35. This is where you get a doctrine that might come close to what that is. 1 Corinthians 7, beginning of verse 1. Now concerning the matters above which I wrote you, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then, come in, then, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as, uh, as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Skipping down to verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about, anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in the body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Whenever we study the Bible, it is important to remember the context. If we read these verses out of context, we might come away thinking that sexual relationships were somehow dirty and that marriage was only to be entered into if we don't have the ability to properly control our sexual desires. But that's not what the passage is saying at all. As discussed earlier, verse 26 tells us that Paul is writing about a time of distress or persecution that Corinth was facing. And so even though Paul was laying down general commands that would be applicable for everyone in all time, he was specifically talking about persecution that the Corinthians were facing. So in light of this, what is Paul saying in 1 Corinthians 7? Well, in verse 1, he says it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's the ESV's rendering of this. Other versions say it's good for a man not to touch a woman. That's the same, the same thing. Now, is Paul saying that sexual relationships are inherently sinful? No. Otherwise, verses 2 to 5 would be a direct contradiction to that statement. They are not inherently sinful. A sexual relationship, when engaged in by two married people who are married to each other, is altogether righteous and wholesome. Let's go back to Hebrews 13 and reread verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Sexual relations by people married to each other is undivided. There is nothing disgusting, shameful, or unholy about it. What defiles the marriage bed? Fornication and adultery. Sex was never intended to be engaged in casually with whomever we feel like. But instead, it is to be engaged in with the person that we have made a covenant with before men and God that we would love and cherish and be with until death. 
So with this being the case, why did Paul say it was good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman? Because if you were to be righteous before God and were having sexual relations with a woman, that meant you were married, which at the present time of persecution wasn't as advantageous as being unmarried. The good in verse 1 therefore has nothing to do with righteousness and sinfulness on the whole, but was advice telling the Corinthians that if they could, it would be good for them to remain unmarried at that time. However, if they wanted to have sexual relations with a woman, it would not be right to do so outside of marriage. Because you could come away saying, well, if it's good to be unmarried, but I really want to have that sexual relationship, I'll just commit fornication and remain unmarried. Paul's saying, no, don't do that. It's always right to be married. It's wrong to engage in such and be not married. So if you want to have that relationship, marry, even at that time of persecution. And they would not be sinning if they did so. Moving down to verses 32 to 35, you might say, isn't Paul saying that unmarried people are more godly than, and married people are more worldly? Not taken out of context. Yes, it appears that's what Paul is saying. But when read in context, we get a completely different picture. Why is someone considered, or sorry, why is someone who is married concerned more about worldly things? And by this, we're talking about the things in this world, not sin. Because they have a spouse and most likely children to take care of. A husband has to ensure that his family has a house to live in, food on the table, and clothes on their back. Those things require money. In order to get money, we're required to work. Work takes time. And now we have less time to devote to the Lord. If a man was single, though, he might decide that he could skip dinner from time to time, which means he wouldn't need as much money. So he could devote more of his time to godly pursuits. But I ask you, where in this passage is it implied that the unmarried man is holier or more righteous than the married man? The passage doesn't say so. All Paul is stating is that unmarried people have more time to devote to God than married people do. And in times of persecution, remember that's the context of this chapter, having less to do with this world and more to do with God will be an advantage. So let's not come along and teach that just because someone has more time to devote to God, that that somehow makes a person more holier or more righteous or more stronger than someone who is not, than someone who is married. The fact is the church needs both single and married people, for both groups have something to offer. Single people will, yes, have more time. And so the church needs to take advantage of that while those single people remain single. Because generally speaking, single people don't remain single forever. But married people are just as useful. For 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 tell us, a church will not have elders or deacons without married people. In truth, we need to realize that it isn't our marriage status which makes us holy and righteous before God, per se. It's whether or not we have been forgiven of our sins through obedience to the Word. In conclusion, Paul warns Timothy about not being seduced by false doctrines, no matter how scriptural they may sound. These false doctrines come in all shapes and forms, but the one thing that they have in common is that all of them will lead us farther away from God. When it comes to marriage, let's not forbid marriage by teaching that people are somehow more holy than those who are married. 
for that marriage is an institution set up by God for those who are weak in the flesh. Let's not go around teaching that. Instead, let's accept the truth that is taught from God's word, which is marriage is honorable in all things and to be enjoyed by men and women alike by following the directions of God. Thank you, Jeremy. And to our viewers, we also thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Should you have a question or comment, please leave it below or email it to answerintheworld at gmail.com. We'll try to respond to you as quickly as we can. We invite you to also watch today's question and answer edition of this podcast, which can be found on our YouTube channel on the Walking Through the Bible 2018 question and answer playlist. We will be taking a two weeks break until Monday, June 11, 2018. We hope you will join us then when we'll be presenting the first lesson of the study of the book of Matthew. Until then, goodbye for now and have a great day. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word, the glory of